All right, thanks, Greg. I uh, appreciate the invitation to visit with you guys here this morning. Um, as Greg said, I'm a faculty member at Iowa State and have been doing trace mineral research for um, quite a while now. So just wanted to share a little bit of our insights from the feedlot standpoint. I am a feedlot nutritionist, but I raise Angus cows um, outside of F uh, Ames, where Iowa State is. So uh, we'll just start by just briefly highlighting what trace minerals are. I want to give credit to the two previous speakers for doing all of the hard work for me. So we're just going to jump into supplementation um, issues and stuff specific to receiving calves. Um, so we know that trace minerals are needed for a lot of different processes in the body, everything from skeletal development, muscle growth, immune function, reproductive performance. Um, and as was just mentioned really nicely, your forages, the feeds we give our cattle, all have trace minerals in them, right? Even if they're in very low amounts. I would say my general um, number I use is that I assume no more than 50% of the trace minerals that are in, say, a forage is maybe available for absorption. And then even that might be absorbed at a really low level by the animal. Um, but you'll see that what we tend to do in the industry is ignore everything in the feed and just supplement what the NRC tells us to do. So um, we have these supplementation programs. Also credit to the speakers for doing a nice job of talking about some of these antagonist issues. So we'll jump into that in a couple of places as well. Okay, so this is my favorite figure to show in just about every mineral presentation that I give. You've probably seen it before. We're looking at performance of an animal here and basically how their trace mineral intake increases from left to right. So trace minerals, I always tell my students, are maintained in this really tight range. We call that homeostasis. Too much is, too, is toxic, too little, causes all these problems we've heard about this morning. What we really want to target is this optimal performance. This is the level where trace minerals are not inhibiting the expression of genetic potential of our animals, their ability to get bred, their ability to marble, et cetera. But if we dial in on that one side of the graph that really talks about getting into the deficiencies, I like this figure too because what we're showing here is as we go from optimal up here to subclinical deficiencies and then clinical, clinical by the way is when you call your vet because something's dead and it shouldn't have died or you've got a big problem. Um, the problem is that here obviously is a problem when the calf's dead, but here is where you're really hemorrhaging dollars and cents regardless of your currency. Um, because you're starting to lose performance that animal. Their immune function's not working properly. They're not responding to their vaccination the way they should. You're getting a few more pulls and treats than you normally should. You didn't get as many cows bred this year as you normally do. Those are all things that look like small problems on the surface, but they compound over time. So what we're gonna talk a little bit is how we can avoid some of this downward slope. Okay, so let's start by talking about receiving 101. So everything on the left side there is what you did to this poor calf. You took him away from his mama, you put him on a truck. In Canada, you may have trucked him a long distance, 48 hours or more in some cases, to get to the feedlot. You probably took him to a sale barn. He met lots of new friends who had lots of fun diseases and shared them with your new calf. Um, so we ran him through a lot, he was stressed, then you put him on a truck and you bring him to the feedlot. And we all keep animal welfare in mind. We, we try to minimize stress as best we can, but we're a segmented industry, so this is what we do, right? We have to move animals from point A to point B. Um, we co-mingled him in the feedlot, and then we gave him a vaccination, and we expected him to produce antibody titers, and we expected him to um, fend off any disease challenges that he gets. And then on the right is everything that you expect this calf to do anyway, because you just paid a lot for him, right? Beef prices are crazy high right now. So you want him to eat, this is the first limiting factor in receiving cattle, right? You need to get this calf to eat, and a lot of times he's never even seen a feed bunk before, let alone whatever that stuff is that you just put in there. He's always had mom and grass to eat, maybe. Um, hopefully somebody preconditioned this calf for you and did some of that work for you. He also needs to find the water. He needs to go drink so that he can uh, drive that dry matter intake. You want him to fight off any disease challenges. And then on top of all of it, you'd really like him to gain and hopefully do that with some degree of efficiency. Okay, so the research evidence suggests that when these stressed cattle come into the receiving, um, into the yard, there's no evidence that says, for example, their zinc requirement or their manganese requirement is truly higher. Now that doesn't mean we won't learn that in the future. We're learning a lot more about these things and how stress affects them. But what we do know is that this calf doesn't want to eat, right? So our solution is to concentrate trace minerals in the diet, in this newly received calf's diet, um, so that we can ensure they get adequate intake. Um, by the way, this is the mineral wheel that Cheryl mentioned earlier. 
like mineral wheel of death. I call it job security if you do trace mineral research because nobody's going to figure that out in 30 years. So we're good. Okay. So I just pulled up the table for what the NRC, this is the um, US Beef Cattle Recommendations NRC, this was updated in 2000. And so what we're looking at is the minerals down there um, uh, on the left. And then this would be what the NRC would recommend for growing beef cattle. So this would be um, a, a typical um, you know, growing feedlot calf. And then there's a very small chapter, it's approximately a paragraph long on minerals in stressed cattle. And this is the recommendations that they have proposed. In general, ballpark figure, these numbers are approximately 150% for a stressed calf compared to a growing calf. So if your calf was requiring 20 parts per million of manganese, you know, we've essentially doubled that or, or maybe a little more. Um, it kind of varies. So anywhere from 150 to 200% of their recommendations. So the recommendations are based on a handful of studies that basically found even though a young feedlot calf who weighs 250 kilos should be eating two and a half to three percent of his body weight in dry matter, he only eats about one and a half percent of his body weight in dry matter for the first week in the feedlot. If he gets to two by the end of week two, you're doing really well. So these are kind of based on concentrating that to overcome the fact that he's not eating very much. Um, I threw chromium on here in the bottom. There's been a little bit of work in the states done recently with chromium. The current NRC has no recommendation established. And just to throw a monkey in this wrench, um, there's a new NRC that was supposed to come out in December. We're anticipating it to come out sometime in the next month. And I don't know what these recommendations will look like when they come out. I suspect that not a lot of things will change. OK, so now I've told you that you need to concentrate the Dickens out of trace minerals in your receiving calf's diet. And uh, one of the things I want to bring to your attention is the fact that when you put a lot of, say, metal sulfates, for example, um, into a feedstuff, sometimes it'll turn off the calf's intake quite nicely. You shouldn't hit those restrictions with the type of um, concentrations that we're talking about. Say, for example, you went from feeding 30 parts per million of zinc from zinc sulfate, and now you doubled it to 60. That's not going to prevent that calf from eating. He's not going to smell the metal and taste the metal and be turned off by it. But there's been some kind of interesting work done with um, mineral fortification of creep feeds. And so I just pulled this, um, this table. It hasn't been published in the scientific literature yet, but this is from John Arlington, who is um, a professor at the University of Florida. This is from the proceedings from the Florida Nutrition Conference. And uh, he's done a lot of work with supplementing um, calves with a creep that's really highly mineral fortified. And he's in Florida, and the two main problems that they have are selenium and copper, which I recently learned is a major problem here in Western Canada as well. So basically what he found is that if he supplemented no mineral in that creep, their intake was about six and a half kilos. If he supplemented, these are really high levels that have, of mineral that he supplemented in here, from sulfate sources like zinc sulfate, manganese sulfate, et cetera, he sees that they, they eat a little bit less. Um, and then there was some um, conversation by Dr. McKinnon talking about organic sources and chelated sources. Um, the hydroxy minerals are another source of trace minerals. From what I understand, you guys have the basic copper chloride approved for use in Canada. This is sold by micronutrients. Um, in the US, we also have a manganese and zinc product available. I think they're working on getting that approval here. But those are the sources they fed to these calves. And you can see that by using a non-sulfate source of trace minerals, they actually overcame that limitation in creep intake. So this is something we're interested in looking at in the future in receiving calf diets to see if these sources make a difference. OK, so trace minerals are important. Hopefully, we've got that take-home message sold well this morning. But let's talk a little bit about why, specifically for this calf, it might be the case. Here's our first problem. Unless you're a better man than I am, and not just because I'm not a man, you don't know what that trace mineral status is of that calf when he arrives in the feedlot. Short of maybe you raised that calf yourself and did your own finishing operation, you just don't have a great handle on what his status is coming into the yard. So that's our first challenge, right? We don't know what his status is. So everything that I've dropped over there on the left are these biological functions that are needed for trace minerals. So trace minerals and vitamins are used in super, super, super small amounts in the diet. That is the technical term, super small. And they're in these super small amounts in the diet, but they are basically important in every biological function in our body and every biological function in this calf's body. So it turns out that you need a whole host of trace minerals 
to basically have a functional immune system. And you need to have a host of minerals to support things like skeletal growth and muscle growth. And these are all things that this 250 kilo calf that just showed up in the pen is going to need to do. Okay, so then on the right side, if I get it to come up, maybe. Okay, that happens to me a lot. Okay, so these are all the things that these are gonna directly function, the health of this animal, how he gains. Um, we've been doing quite a bit of work with feed efficiency in our group, and we find a lot of the trace minerals influence feed efficiency in a positive manner, carcass quality. Really enjoyed your beef pit discussion this morning and talking about the things you wanna do to move the Canadian beef industry forward, and a lot of that discussion was genetic markers and SNPs and things like that, right? I think we're gonna learn more and more about how important trace minerals are in supporting some of these things like carcass quality and feed efficiency. Okay. It really doesn't like this slide. There we go, all right. Okay, just briefly wanna highlight trace minerals and immune function. These are some of the things that come to mind. Um, some of the speakers have talked about the issues with measuring minerals in the blood. Um, copper, for sure, blood does not tell you much about the status of that animal until they are really, really deficient. The liver um, is basically like the gas tank and the blood is like the fuel line. That fuel line is going to still get a constant drip of fuel until the gas tank is empty. And so the serum copper doesn't drop until the animal has really got a pretty deplete status. So when you're showing numbers like 0.4 parts per million of copper um, in the blood, those animals are pretty deficient. Um, this is one of the reasons why it's difficult to assess blood copper, and that's because copper is important in a protein called ceruloplasmin, which is a really important acute phase protein, which basically means as soon as you get stressed and as soon as you start to mount an immune response or have an infection, this is released in part of that, um, that response. There's also roles for zinc and copper and selenium in things like neutrophil function, which are sort of the first line of defense in the calf's immune system lymphocytes, T cells, these are all things that are gonna potentially play a role in how they respond to vaccination or the, how they respond to disease challenges. So I went back to the NRC and looked up some of the original studies that they used to determine why stressed calves might need to have some of these higher concentrations of minerals. You might have noticed the zinc in particular, that range was 70 to 100 parts per million, which is markedly greater than the 30 we recommend for a growing calf. I think it's because a lot of the early work was, was done with zinc. We feel like we have some of the best evidence that says zinc is very important in, um, in immune function and receiving health. So I'm just gonna highlight a few of these studies. This was um, some work done from um, Dr. Sharace and others in 91 and 94, a series of studies. So I've just pulled out a couple of figures from them. Basically what we're looking at here is calves that either got a control diet that had about 30 parts per million of zinc, basically, what our recommendation is for, for growing cattle. And then they had a diet that they added zinc methionine to, so this would be a chelated source, zinc bound to a methionine molecule, and they added an additional 60, so 30 and 90 milligrams of zinc per kilogram for our two treatments here. And then basically they challenged these calves with the herpes virus, with IVR, um, challenged them, and then monitored rectal temperature and feed intake change after the disease challenge. So this is challenging them with a the disease in a controlled environment. So the first thing you'll see is that this drop down here is the percent dry matter intake change after that challenge. So as expected, the calf got sick, dry matter intake drops. Dry matter intake is dropping here. It takes over two weeks to recover back to those um, initial levels. And this is inverse to the rectal temperatures increasing up here. The thing that was interesting in this is that it's kind of hard to see, but this line that's up the top one here that has a little um, like kind of crosses through it, that's the zinc supplemented calves. And so what they found is that zinc supplemented calves went back to their pre-infection dry matter intake level within less than a week. If they did not receive the extra zinc, it took them almost two full weeks, I think it was 11 days, before they got back to their pre-infection dry matter intake levels. Getting a calf back on feed is one of the most critical things we can do after he's been sick. So this was the first, some of the first data to suggest that zinc is really important in helping them recover. Okay, they did another study. In this study, they looked at both zinc and manganese methionine, and then they also looked at zinc and manganese from oxide sources as well. So again, control cattle, about 30 milligrams of zinc per kilogram of diet, pretty close to the requirement for normal cattle, and then an additional 50, so 30 versus 80 for total zinc concentrations here. 
we're ignoring manganese for now. Although I should comment, I'm one of the few people that have done some of the manganese research in breeding cattle and stuff, and uh, there, there hasn't been much work done in that. So we don't know a lot about how manganese fits into the story here. Um, so control zinc oxide here and kind of light bar, and then this is actually the zinc methionine up here. What we're looking at is plasma zinc concentrations after the infection. So to summarize, basically, when you have an infection, one of the things that your body does is it goes through something called nutritional immunity. And nutritional immunity is a big fancy phrase to say copper goes up in the blood and zinc and iron go down because things like invading bacteria tend to want to use iron and bacteria to replicate and make more of themselves. So a protective mechanism is to say, okay, let's get all of the zinc and, and iron out of the blood. So this is very typical that after an animal gets sick, we see this big drop in, say, plasma zinc concentrations. Um, but what we can see here is that when they got supplemented with the oxide, it was a little bit better. And when they got supplemented with the zinc methionine, they didn't have as big of a drop. So later research would show that actually if we can keep some of these serum levels of zinc higher, we seem to have better antibody production and things like that. So even though the body wants to have this big overzealous response and pull the zinc away, we know that we still need some zinc to have normal immune function. So the last one I'll show from these authors is one of their papers from 94. This is actually from the same study from the previous slide with the plasma zinc. So same dietary treatments, 30 milligrams of zinc, an additional 50 from the um, zinc um, methionine or zinc oxide diets. Um, the X are kind of cross shapes here. This is the zinc methionine. The little X's there is the zinc oxide. And then the lowest line there is the control. What you can basically see here is that the zinc methionine, a little bit more bioavailable source of zinc, so they were probably utilizing it a little bit more. They didn't drop their body weight change after infection quite as much. And then up here, you can see that within a month after the infection, both zinc sources are pretty much comparable. But again, they're higher than those that had lower zinc in the diet, suggesting that infecting uh, or uh, concentrating the zinc in the diet can help to um, uh, improve the status. Okay. So we'll just talk briefly about a couple of receiving studies here. So I mentioned that we don't always know what the receiving status is of our calf for trace minerals. These are a couple of studies that have been done at uh, the University of Arkansas that basically looked at receiving cattle in unknown uh, trace mineral status, high stress animals. In, in my country, high stress animals come from Kentucky. So they have no copper and um, they're generally the highest strung heifers you can find. So I think that's what they used in this study. They basically split half and half and gave um, no injection. Or um, John mentioned this briefly. We have a product called Multimin. I'm going to show you a couple of studies with it. It's not approved here in Canada yet, but they are working on it. This is an injectable source of copper, selenium, zinc, and manganese. So essentially split them half and half, had a 42-day trial, and found that when the animals got Multimin, they had an improvement in average daily gain and also uh, a lesser amount of animals that had to be pulled and treated um, with antibiotics. So these authors followed up and they had some receiving heifers here and essentially found that animals, this is looking at body weight, that got a trace mineral injection had better body weight after a 55 day receiving trial if they use the trace mineral injection to increase status. And if you wanted to apply this to your operation and you don't have an injectable mineral, that's fine. The idea is we need to find a way to improve the status of our animals early in that receiving period. Um, just to do it, put some um, uh, currency on here or to some economics on here, this is again following up with these heifers. Um, the white is the control and the dark is those that got the injectable trace mineral. And you can essentially see that morbidity was cut from about 85 to 50 percent. So these um, quite a few animals that got sick here, they had less secondary and third treatments, and that translated to the difference between about $7 difference, basically doubling in the cost of antibiotics for those animals if they did not get the injectable trace mineral. Um, this product probably would have cost about two bucks per calf to use, so that's a pretty good return on investment with these um, high-stressed animals. Okay, so this is probably one of the reasons why they're seeing things like that. I'm going to show you a couple of these injectable trace mineral studies in part because they're the only ones I can find that have specifically looked at some of this titer response. Um, this is uh, work that John Augenton from the University of Florida has uh, presented. And this is looking at um, bovine herpes virus type 1, so again our IBR. And we are looking at titer production after a vaccination. So these were animals that had no circulating titers before the vaccination. And then they measured titers over about a 90-day period. 
and basically found that when they got injectable trace minerals shown here in the diamonds, their antibody titers peaked more quickly than those that did not get the injectable minerals. So improving their mineral status helped to increase the antibody titers of these animals. So in theory, if these animals then had a disease challenge because you brought them a new friend in the feedlot or, or something else, they could have a better immune response. This is definitely a really interesting area for um, a feedlot nutritionist, and we need to do more work in this area. Um, one other one that I'll follow up from Dr. Arlington's group, and that is looking at um, uh, antibody or titers in response to giving a porcine red blood cell injection. So basically injecting a foreign body into the animal and looking to see how they do their immune response. And again, similar trend where we see uh, greater titer production more, more quickly in those that had the injectable trace minerals. So rapidly improving their status translated to an improvement in circulating titers. Okay, so I want to move into a couple of the studies that we've um, done at Iowa State as we kind of wrap up here. And so there's a lot of things that we know that transit or moving animals around in a truck are going to do. And one of these is that there's evidence that actually increases the trace mineral excretion of these calves. So we wanted to follow up with the study and said, okay, let's change the trace mineral status of young calves. These were a group of calves, bought off a, um, Angus calves, bought off a ranch in Kansas, trucked about eight hours to us, and um, put them through a 28-day preconditioning period. And in that 28-day preconditioning period, we gave half of them an injection of saline and half of them um, an injection of multimin. And then we picked a subset of calves before that injection, and we biopsied them to say what's their initial status. Um, so you don't have to memorize these numbers. I probably won't give you a test at the end, maybe. Um, but the take home message is these cattle all had very adequate status at the start of this study. So remember that. Okay, that's our experimental design. Half got saline, half got multimin. Here's where it was kind of interesting. After 28 days, we then took half of the cattle and we put them on a truck and we drove them around the state of Iowa um, for 20 hours. And we dr always drive them around the state of Iowa because Dr. Hansen always forgets to get health papers and they can't leave the state. So our truckers are always super excited when we do these studies. Um, so half of them drove around the state of Iowa and the other half stayed in their home pens. And this was kind of to separate psychological from physical stress. These guys didn't go on the truck, but they simply stayed in their pens and had no feed and water access. Okay, so we wanted to see um, what our effect was here. Just jump to this. First one is we took lots of blood measures, lots of rectal temperatures, things like that. These are looking at a couple of markers of inflammation. Haptoglobin is a nice marker of inf inflammation in the, in the calf. Increases, here's his pre-truck value, here's after he gets off the truck, and here's plasma fibrinogen, another stress marker. So we did induce stress in these cattle by shipping them. Here's our initial body weight. So basically these calves weighed just under 300 kilos when we put them on the truck. 20 hours later, we have magically lost 20 to 25 kilos of body weight. And that translated to roughly 7 to 8 percent um, body strength. The one thing that was interesting here was to have this interaction between whether they got saline or multimin and the way that we shipped them or not. And basically what we see is that if you just look at the cattle that did not get multimin, just saline, their percent body strength if they stayed in the home pen but didn't have feed and water was a little over 7 percent. And it's a lot greater. It's just under 9 if we put them on a truck. But there's no difference in shrink between those that got shipped and those that didn't if they got multimin. So we want to look into this further and see what that might mean because the take home message here is that these guys all had adequate status from the beginning of the trial and we didn't see any response to using an injectable mineral because of that. Okay, so our follow up study to that was to say what happens if we, Greg is giving me the eye, okay, if we um, change the status here. So I just want to show this study. We took uh, 40 Angus calves. For 90 days, we put half of them on a trace mineral adequate diet and half of them on a trace mineral deficient diet. After 90 days, we took liver biopsies, and I'll just use copper as an example. Here's the biopsies from the 20 steers on the adequate diet. Here's the biopsies from the 20 steers on the deficient diet. There's two things here. One, obviously the deficient have lower copper. This is only mildly copper deficient, but look how much tighter they are already compared to the spread in the adequate. Okay, so we, we did an okay job. We got some mild deficiencies. We did the same thing, put them on a truck, drove them around the state of Iowa for 20 hours, weighed them again a couple of days later, and this is what we found. If an animal had an adequate trace mineral diet, they didn't lose as much body weight in that shipping stress period as if they were on a trace mineral deficient diet before. 
And what this really came down to is the fact that when these cattle came back off that truck, if they had trace mineral deficient um, status, they took almost two weeks to get their feed intake back up to normal. And the controls were back within 24 hours. That's a big difference. And I want to stress again that these animals were only mildly deficient. Like, NRC would not even say they were in the deficient category yet. So, you know, we're just mildly deficient, and it's clearly impacting dry matter intake. Um, this is the liver copper, so out after um, giving an injectable trace mineral, so just showing that mineral increases liver copper. This would have been our shipping period right here. Um, and then just to show that beyond the receiving period, this does have impacts. This is average daily gain. So if those animals were on a deficient diet and we gave them multi-min after they got off that truck, they have better average daily gain through the finishing period. Okay, I'm literally on the last slide. Maybe the second last slide. Okay, newly arrived cattle don't necessarily have a greater trace mineral requirement, but they will eat less. There is value in considering um, fortifying that diet with more trace minerals. If our animals have even a mildly deficient status, they don't seem to go back on feed as quickly, and therefore they're not responding to the stress of shipping and arriving as well. Um, more work definitely needs to be done in collaboration with vets and nutritionists to look into this antibody um, issue. And because we don't know the status of the trace minerals of this newly received calf, I really encourage you to consider supplementing trace minerals, whether that's injectable or in the diet or some combination, as a risk management tool because you can see that when they are even mildly deficient, you can really have negative payoff from that. Um, so consider supplementing 100 to 150 percent of NRC in basically that first two to four weeks in the receiving period. Okay. Thank you for your attention, and if Greg lets me, I'll ask, answer any questions. Absolutely. We'll give the opportunity for one question from the floor, if there is one. 